some of the data I was surprised about. Millennial and Gen Z, that they didn't want more dense housing. And so that was a little bit surprising to me. I think residents don't know what affordable housing is. Mm -hmm. That's us talking about a recent survey that took the pulse of the Long Island region today. The survey was sponsored by NextLI Newsday and Hofstra University and was conducted over the summer with funding from Google News Initiative's Innovation Challenge. It had an unusually large sample, 2,910 residents of Nassau and Suffolk counties. It used online and in-person outreach to get responses, and all the answers were weighted to represent the adult population of Long Island. Sometimes I'm like, where am I? <laughs> Is this Long Island? Like, am I like on a farm? Our conversation included Retha Fernandez, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Suffolk County, previously an executive at the Urban League and Estee Lauder. Long Island is very much um, tied to the identity of what suburbia is with the American dream. That's Daniel Lloyd, the founder of Minority Millennials and program director of Accelerate Long Island, an organization that supports high-tech investments locally. Half of Long Islanders are struggling to make ends meet, and part of that is for the conversation that we've been having. Housing is too expensive. This is Gwen O'Shea, the president of the Community Development Corporation of Long Island, a nonprofit that advocates for housing needs. Prior to that, she led the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. Leaders could help create more opportunities for Long Islanders. And that's Stacy Sykes, the vice president of the Long Island Association, the leading business organization in the region. She's the former director of the Small Business Institute at Hofstra University. In the survey, 50% of respondents told us they are considering leaving Long Island. So we started the discussion with a simple question. Why are you staying? I love the communities and how the communities each have their own character, the water, north and south of us, the schools, great health care, my family's close. I think from the survey, a lot of people like the same things about suburbia. I think it just needs to be tweaked a little bit. I think it needs to be kind of reimagined for the 21st century and for younger people. It needs to be, like Dan said, more affordable. Uh, there needs to be more housing options. I think it's crazy to think that a starter house on Long Island costs six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Like, who can afford that? It's not a starter, right? Mm -hmm. So I love the beaches and the vineyards and mm -hmm. all of that, but is that enough to make me stay? Especially with the cost, I don't know. And then I have one son, and if he leaves, like, why else would I be staying? Mm -hmm. But also, the cost of living here is extremely high. So I think that has a huge impact on people's wallets, on people's emotions. And the stress levels continue to um, add to the pressures of what is a suburban lifestyle. And it, can you get that best suburban lifestyle on Long Island? And I think a lot of people are starting to realize that they can probably get it in North Carolina, in Florida, um, in other areas. So There are aspects that while we love Long Island, there are aspects that we need to have here to make it the community of our future. And there are aspects of the history of our communities that we need to change to make it a sustainable, inclusive area. And I think where we're sitting today is a perfect example of that, right? We're sitting in one of the newer affordable development complexes here on Long Island, 45 units, transit oriented, walkability to different restaurants, to different shops, to a great aspect of, of how we describe our thriving communities here on Long Island, right? Because our economy is made up of, of small businesses. Gwen, can you tell us a little bit about where we are, just about kind of what this unit looks like and what, the, what this project, how this project worked? So um, we're sitting in uh, Port Jefferson Crossing that, as I mentioned earlier, really um, started with the vision of the mayor. And by creating 45 affordable workforce, obtainable housing, however you want to phrase it, what it does is it creates home for 45 families so that they are paying rent that makes sense based on the income they have coming into their household, allows them to pay rent no more than 30% of their income, save so that they can walk to downtown, spend some money, invest locally, maybe save to become a homeowner, um, and is a great, um, residency to call home. And it's only 45, you said, right? I know. And mo But most people <laughs> yeah. think that they see a development like this and they think that, it, you know, the schools are going to be crowded. We saw that in the survey. For sure. That whole myth about schools, it's only That's right. 45. That's right. Equals 45. That's one of the biggest myths yeah. when you yes. talk about housing that all of a sudden it's going to flood the school districts, which is, which is not the case. And this was community driven and a blighted property that has this beautiful development now right next to the train station. I mean, I think that is also a good model 
for other communities to look at. Absolutely. And just down the block is a luxury development that's coming up, which I think speaks to the importance to some of the comments you were bringing up earlier of having a diversified yeah. you know, community at every level. And that's what makes a community successful. 45 units just may be a sweet spot, since our survey showed that the topic of density is complicated. So I thought in the survey it was really interesting when you, you asked about housing. A lot of the responses had um, said, not don't make it more dense, mm -hmm. but let's kind of rethink yeah, I... what housing is. Condos, co-ops, townhomes, tiny houses, more sustainable houses by train stations and downtown. So it's not changing everything we know about suburbia, it's kind of evolving to meet the needs of our next generation, I think. They pointed out the need to follow up with this community and even those surveyed to see if attitudes shift in the next few years. Marketing like the successes of these developments and maybe going even back into the communities and surveying maybe five, six years after the development mm -hmm. to see how you know, the um, lifers feel about what's next door to them, basically. The marketing, I think, is huge because if you talk about Levittown, there was marketing to get people from the city. So my great grandmother was like, mm -hmm. when there was these commercials, you know, move to Levittown, you know, sure. and her mother was like, why would you want to move to Long Island? What is out Long Island? So there was a, a massive amount of marketing and, and language to get people to Long Island. Another thing the survey found is that Long Island is way above the national median when it comes to people living here their whole lives. Our roots on Long Island are tied to the American dream. I think that's extremely unique and very strong. So when I talk to, I'm biracial, so African American and Irish, right? And both of my grandparents, great grandparents really, one moved to Levittown from the city, so talking about starter homes for $5,000, and then my, my great grandfather on my black side moved to Rockville Center. There's like a little project there. Both of my generations that pass down the houses don't want more density, regardless of racial background or how they attain their houses. So there's kind of like this feeling like, why should I have to help when my family went through three or four generations to attain the American dream? Right. And as a region that still has a disproportionate percentage, you know, of housing stock in single family mm -hmm. homes, it does speak to, though, the opportunity of creating economic stability by becoming a homeowner. And for the next generation, again, we can't do that in the same way we did it 50, 60 years ago. It's just the region is not like that. The finances are not like that. The government support is not like that. So we need to create additional housing opportunities that, again, allow for that savings opportunity and that financial stability to happen so we decrease the number of people spending 40, 50, 60 percent of their income on housing because that's not a good quality of life to live. It's expensive to live on Long Island, but our survey showed residents may justify the expense because they like the hyper-local services. What did you guys make of it? I thought it made sense in terms of, um, you know, the survey found that people liked the suburb, had more confidence in Long Island than the federal government, and it kind of went super local, and then it like, uh, you know, the confidence waned. So in terms of being super local, nothing's more local than your schools and your police and your local government. So it kind of, the themes throughout the survey showed that Long Islanders really liked their local control and their local community. Besides housing, Long Islanders said in the survey that other challenges for the region are drug abuse and traffic on the roads. They offered one solution for traffic. Having more developments like this next to train stations, right. yeah, absolutely. Um, making it easier to get places, even if it's on Long Island, I think we have to work on that north-south connection, but yeah. um, you know, be, having housing near train stations will also make that easier. We asked these four key Long Islanders to talk about the survey results that stood out to them and the lessons the findings have for our leaders. I thought it was interesting that younger people, Gen Z and millennials, I think they were more, if you look at the age breakdown, they were more satisfied with Long Island than some older generations. Mm. I thought that was, you know, mm. I'm, I'm hoping that generation is optimistic too. And these are people that have young families or don't have any kids yet. and. Um, I think that's good news for us because, like Dan said, they're going to be the ones who are going to reimagine suburbia, bring it in yeah. to the 21st century. 
Um, I also think that um, Long Island, we talked about this, but Long Island's demographics are changing. We're becoming much more diverse. And to ensure our region stays vibrant, we need to make sure as we change and we grow, it's inclusive because it will help our economy as a whole. Like I said earlier, I think residents have local government kind of in a, um, you know, a grapple because they actually are responding to what residents are saying they want, which is part of our dilemma as a region. I think moving forward, local leaders need to be a little more bold. That should be what they're accountable to. Younger and future elected leaders are gonna be a lot more bold. And I think they're gonna be a lot less scared of not getting reelected. Uh, and that's what we need. We need public officials that see a vision, see the need, and are willing to take a loss potentially um, in an election to get things done. You know, there's never been progress without a risk. After this talk, we went straight to the source to hear from actual Long Islanders who took the survey to find out more about their lives and the answers they gave. First up is Dina, who grew up on Long Island, left, and just recently returned. I currently live in Huntington Station, um, uh, New York, Long Island. I'm the chief HR officer um, at the teacher's retirement system of the city of New York. Um, have a six-year-old daughter, uh, my husband and I. Um, we live here um, originally from um, Huntington grew up here, graduated high school, um, you know, came back, left, came back, left, um, you know, lived in Brooklyn, um, past couple of years, actually just relocated back to Huntington, um, August, end of August of this year. Dina gave us her views of the challenges here. If you asked me this 10, 15 years ago, I probably would have said it's affordable housing, Right. Um, because at the time, you know, just out of grad school, really not being able to afford um, housing. Um, but now as someone, you know, um, later on in years who has a child um, and who is kind of a little bit more settled, um, you know, I think for me is maintaining the quality of life um, as far as, you know, services, probably because of the space I'm in, you kind of start looking at the you know, pros and cons of affordable housing, right? Um, and, you know, when you start thinking about density, right? And you start thinking about just, you know, how do you do it so that it doesn't become where um, you have absentee landlord or that you have a really transit population that kind of changed the makeup of, you know, a community, right? So, yeah, I think as you get older and kind of priorities change, you know, um, you know, some things do change, right? Like where, you know, back then I wanted, you know, kind of a thriving downtown, which actually I still do, right? Because I want to not have to go into the city, right? So, you know, I do think we should have, and I think we have a decent economy, but I think economy would probably be one of the, you know, concerns. How do you kind of keep downtowns, um, you know, from surviving, especially post COVID when businesses are just so challenged? Um, and, right. You know, I think for me, we're grateful in Huntington because there's a lot of new things coming up from Whole Foods to, you know, grocery stores and other things. So it's probably a little bit different than others. But for more options um, to, to own, right, or more programs um, to own. New York is really it for me and it's the base. I like it. Maybe it's because I'm a creature of comfort, um, but I've, you know been in Long Island since I was 14 and just like my community is still the same, you know, some of the same people. Right. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't see myself living anywhere else, especially for what I get and the things that are va of value to me that are here. Next, we spoke to Richard, a longtime Long Islander. I moved to Long Island so 40 years ago, 50 years ago, something like that. Profession, electrical engineer, which retired. And then I did some adjunct teaching over at Farmingdale, Nassau Community. Got it. All right. I do that. And right now I'm retired, retired. Fully retired. Yes. And do you have any family on, on Long Island or elsewhere? Uh, on Long Island? Well, I have the other half of my life was wandering around here somewhere. But kids go from uh, Texas to Pennsylvania to wherever. And uh, so gotcha. no, they're not a local on Long Island. Richard also talked about the issues here. Too much traffic, too many people. Uh, 
you know, otherwise it's, you know, functionally very good, but it's still quieter and more peaceful than the city. Uh, if I want to do something, I can get in my car, go to where I'm going, and now end up in proximity to where I want to be. In the city, you have to go, you either walk or you're taking a train, and it, it's a hassle to do anything or get anywhere. There are too many individualistic things that are going on. You have this one's day and that one's day and the other thing. We need to have something cohesive on the entire island. Not necessarily Ronkonkoma and Huntington and Long Beach and Montauk. There's no sense of Long Island being an entity. It's little groups here and little groups there and little groups somewhere else. I'm not quite sure how to foster that. Another survey taker we followed up with was Linda, a real estate agent here who knows the region well. Originally, I'm from Brooklyn, and then I, I lived in Long Beach. I'd say about 2008, I moved from Long Beach to Center Beach. And um, I'm a real estate broker. And, um, you know, I've gotten to really love Long Island. I mean, when I was younger, I really did, and I wanted to be in the city. But now it's like I really like it here. It's, you know, especially where I am now in Center Beach. People are very friendly the, the animal friendly, so it's kind of nice here. Well, it, it, the housing costs is really high. I mean, I get calls every. I when I first moved out here in two thousand eight, when the market crashed, I did a lot of section eight, a lot of shelter people. I was able to get people placed in homes and get them going education and get them moving. But now it's just the uh, rental prices are so high. A lot of landlords decided to sell because they don't really want to deal with the the laws now that New York State made the laws so strict and it's been harder to evict. So there's less housing and less affordable housing. So there's a lot of people out there that if they don't own a house already, they, they're in trouble, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no desire to leave New York. Is there anywhere else in the world that you could envision living, um, even if you're not uh, going right now? No, I mean, it's, I, I think it'd be too much of an adjustment for me and too much of a New Yorker. I like the diversity. I like all the different types of food. I don't know. I just think it's very... I'm comfortable here. This public opinion survey was sponsored by NextLI Newsday and Hofstra University and was conducted from August 3rd through September 1st, 2022. The project was made possible through funding from Google News Initiative's Innovation Challenge. An unusually large sample totaling 2,910 residents of Nassau and Suffolk counties participated and were recruited through multiple avenues to ensure diversity of attitudes. Answers were provided via online panel, face-to-face -face intercept interviews at popular venues in both counties, and QR codes made available to the public. Data were weighted to represent the adult population of Long Island. I'm Mark Chisano, an editorial writer and columnist at Newsday.